uh, Oscar looks quite young. Anyway, he's professionally quite old or experienced. Uh, is motivated and driven professional working as a cycling coordinator uh, and urban transportation experts at the city of Helsinki. And what was surprising for me, except for reading all these great ideas and their competencies and skills and experience, is that you are in the situation as City of Helsinki that you are redesigning and somehow transforming the network for bikers. And I said, okay, so, so where are we and where are you? So it will be quite interesting to hear your experience about, so where are you, what are you now doing? So please go on. Press it. And uh, now the microphone's on. So, yeah. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. And I understand I've been given the challenge of keeping everyone awake after a nice hearty lunch. So, challenge accepted. I hope that my presentation will maintain your interest. So, uh, yeah. Great to be here and really, really enjoying the summer like weather. Uh, my name is Oskar Kaupimäki, as was announced. And I do work as the cycling coordinator and urban transportation specialist in, uh, in Helsinki, Finland. And despite of my young appearance, I do turn 34 this year. Yeah, 34 is still young. I like to consider that young, but I do realize that I probably look younger than I actually am. And um, I was going to do a grand entrance. Um, this epic, epic, dramatic entrance being that guy coming in from the north, from, with the, from the land of the northern lights and the midnight sun, but then I realized they have Icelanders here. So they, they kind of burst my bubble. Yeah, even now they're far away, they're always kind of far away, but now we've never been this close. But I'm, I'm also n happy that I'm not the only Nordic representative here, but I'm still kind of gonna, gonna go with it. So even though Helsinki is not as far north as Reykjavik, it is as far north as Anchorage, Alaska. It's at latitude 60, so we don't consider the midnight sun we have in the summer, but it doesn't get dark in the winter, it's dark all the time. And uh, when you consider this northern, northern reality, uh, you might think that we have igloos and snowbanks and reindeer running in the streets, but when you look at downtown Helsinki in May, it pretty much looks like any other European city in May. You have people walking, you have people on bikes, we have trams, we have buses, we have cars, and uh, people are not dressed in parkas. It actually is sunny and it actually is warm, though 15 degrees is considered summer weather in Helsinki this time of year. But it is north. And as I said, you might have this idea that we have a lot of snow, we have the northern lights, we have what is probably more normal in Iceland, but actually uh, the reality of winters in uh, Finland, which can be somewhat considered continental Europe, is this. Uh, the only way you can tell that this picture is taken in December is that this picture is taken at 11 o'clock in the morning. And it's still quite dark. The thing is that if it's cloudy at Helsinki, Stockholm latitude in December, it never really gets light during the day. And uh, we do things to kind of accommodate for that. And then the Danes came up with the name Hugo. And I realized that we, well, Hugo was explained to me that we all do the same thing. And that the Danes were just the only ones to give it that name. But sometimes, of course, when the winds come in from the north, we get blessed with the dumping of snow. And as you can tell, yeah, the snow is really visible in the streetscape, but it doesn't halt the city to the ground. People still keep going. Then again, you might um, understand that maybe we get this for nine months of the year, but actually on average, if we get snow, we have it for about one month of the year anymore. And the meteorologists in Finland are saying that by 2050, our winters are gonna be like the winters in Northern Germany currently. And uh, people also continue moving on bikes. Of course, I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, the share of cycling does drop in the winter, but it doesn't disappear. You, we still have about 40,000 trips made by bike a day, even in the winter when many people say that, well, you can't cycle in the winter. But now we approach the main topic here. So I'm gonna talk about how Helsinki is in a state of transformation. So one part of that transition, yes, is integrating the bicycle into the mix. But doing this transition is about so much more than just the bike. And it starts with city strategy. And uh, well, our strategy was just upgraded uh, at the end of last year. Now we're being subtle, subtle again. We are growing. We are at a place for growth. But uh, our previous strategy was something I really kind of like to milk because 
Many people probably are aware that Finns have a reputation, well, all Nordics have a reputation of being kind of humble, kind of stern, not wanting to boast about our accomplishments or what we do. And that's why I find it really, really, well, the best word I can come up with now is glamorous that our former mayor, Jan Vapaavuori, sat down at one of those numerous steering group meetings where they're deciding on policy and said, you know what, we want to be nothing less but the most functional city in the world. And then maybe a little, yeah, we, we are doing it. So yeah, just the most functional city in the world, and they actually started going through with that. So here we are as humble Finns trying to, you know, compete with many, many other fascinating cities that there are in the world. And this strategy that was now upgraded, that we're calling it a place for growth, is the first time we're actually mentioning cycling on its own. And not just mentioning that cycling is fun, yay, but we're saying that we have a bicycle action plan, which I will talk about in a minute in a little bit more detail, that we need to expedite, we need to implement it to the ground faster than originally intended so that the city can truly become functional. We cannot call our city the most functional city in the world if we do not have a most functional bicycle infrastructure. And then, you know, with that grand strategy, we have many sub-strategies under it. Actually, this one was made back in 2015, which actually represents the traffic triangle we saw earlier, where pedestrian is the king, second comes the people on bikes, then it's public transportation, fourth is goods transportation, and then last, private cars. And you know, many of you probably hear these outcries from those devoted motorists saying that you're banning cars. And what I like to tell them is no, we're actually making driving for you better. Because when you integrate all modes into the transportation mix, those people who actually need the car, they will have better access to using it. They'll have more capacity on the road network. I mean, why are the drivers in the Netherlands the happiest drivers in the world? You'd expect that that would be the worst place on earth to drive a car, but it seems to be the opposite. And of course, cycling is linked to carbon neutrality. We have a really comprehensive carbon neutrality target. And in the Nordics, when we say that we want to be carbon neutral by 2035, it's really embarrassing if we don't. So we better get there. And uh, one of the numerous measures is doubling the model share cycling from the current 10% to 20%. And if you don't do that, even though it only has a 2% carbon reduction uh, potential, if you don't do that, we will not become carbon neutral. So that's challenging enough. But now, now with our new strategy, we decided that we can't become carbon neutral by 2035. We need to become carbon neutral by 2030. And it, was, uh, it passed by rather easily, but now, um, well, it's a warm way of saying it, but now in the planning departments we're saying, okay, we need to basically construct everything five years sooner. And uh, good thing we already had a good premise for that. Um, dense and mixed land use has been at least referred to in many of the previous presentations, which is a really important premise for making a cycling city. And Helsinki is doing that with the public transit approach. So not everything is centered in the urban core. We also have some sprawl. But thankfully, a lot of that sprawl is based on trunk lines of suburban trains, suburban rail, or metros. So what we are doing is we are densifying the land use around those uh, public transit hubs. We're creating new trunk lines for public transit, and then we're improving the catchment areas around those uh, public transit hubs to enable people to, you know, integrate the bicycle into the public tra transport mix as well. Then, of course, there's traffic calming. Promoting cycling and uh, improving conditions for it. it's not about just building cycle tracks everywhere. It's about mixing when you can another Dutch principle. So when you're in residential areas, you make sure that cars do a maximum of 30 kilometers an hour. The streets are narrow so that cycling for people who are eight years old and 80 years old can do it safely and it feels comfortable. So it doesn't feel like a street, but more like a wide cycle track. And then with these slides, I'm most likely preaching to the choir, but these are things that we've had to establish in Helsinki to get, gain a comprehensive understanding in all the people why we're doing this. So it's not just to promote cycling for the sake of cycling, but it is to you know, make people healthier. We, we are all aware of all those studies that show that, for example, if you ride your bike 30 minutes a day, you can actually increase your life expectancy by six months, or some other studies show that it could be even more environment. Because when we are building this egalitarian 
transport system. We reduce carbon emissions, so that's a no-brainer. Time benefits, this is just something we really showed because public transportation use is really popular in Helsinki. People replace walking with trams because we have such a dense tram network in the downtown area. But then we showed them this graph saying that you could actually cycle a du double the distance than a tram in some place. And people are like, oh, wow, really? They didn't really think about it that way. Then space, this is probably, everyone is aware of this and this is something we show because the city is growing. The city of Helsinki is expected to reach about 890,000 people by 2050, and if we base it on even the current status quo, we're going to start seeing gridlock on our streets, so we cannot have the model share of cars stay the same. We need to create more space-efficient modes of transportation. And of course, when you create this space-efficient urban transportation, you get more people to where the dense mixed land use is, and you create urban life. So once again, not all about the bike. And uh, this is something that I really feel is important to show, especially in Finland, because when they say that Copenhagen or Amsterdam are the cities of cyclists, many Finnish cities are city of, cities of walkers. Like the walking model share in Helsinki is 49%. People do a lot of walking there. And now that we're promoting cycling, we've taken it from a marginalized position to an integrated position. We're hearing a lot of feedback saying, you've forgotten about the walkers. And I say, um, you're wrong, but it's good that you bring that up because we forget to mention that when we're talking about promoting cycling, we're also creating better environment for people on foot. Because Finland, like Sweden, has a long history of the so-called scaft model, where cars came into the mix, took up the space, and then we created these mixed-use paths everywhere where cyclists and pedestrians share the same path. Now we're reversing from that, and what we're leaving is sidewalks that are dedicated for pedestrians, and one good example is junctions. It's clear for both people on bikes and people on foot where they should be. So we've made a lot of progress so far, but we are in a grand state of a transformation. Uh, and I mentioned the, the Swedish-based SCAFT model, which was uh, you know mixing cycling and uh, pedestrians and also saying that you can never ever mix cars and bikes. But in 2012, we entered a paradigm shift. So what we actually did, we invited planners from the Netherlands and we invited planners from Denmark to come in, do workshops with our planners in Helsinki, coaching us on how we should do it. And we had two dedicated urban professionals who already knew it pretty well, that how we could change Helsinki. And of course, we looked at how the Netherlands the mecca of cycling, but then we realized that they've done certain things, they've evolved in certain things so far that we'd hear the same rhetoric you hear everywhere else. It's like, we can never be Amsterdam, we can never be Utrecht. But then we looked at Copenhagen. We see it's a Nordic city, similar land use, similar transport system, similar climate, copy and paste. And we maybe take a little cherry on top from the Netherlands. So in 2012, we took the Crow manual, the design manual for bicycle traffic from the Netherlands, summarized it, translated it into Finnish, and we turned that into the bicycle design manual for the city of Helsinki. We took that to city board, it was accepted, and then it was then, it's now used as a fundamental premise in all street planning. So not just bicycle planning, but whenever you have a project involving a street, the bicycle design manual is one thing every planner is required to look at. And then in two, just a year ago, the uh, national guidelines were pretty much based on the Helsinki guidelines. So we acted as a front runner, and uh, now we're making an influence on the way that bicycling is taking into the mix in the rest of the country. And with that design manual, we also drew out a network. Because you've got to have a network. You can't just have one great cycle facility in one place. You've got to draw out a network so you make sure that you have continuity and coherence so it's logical for people. So in 2014, 12, we made a target network for the inner city, where according to the SCAFT model, you couldn't fit cycle tracks. Then in 2016, that was uh, expanded to cover the entire city. Um, I'm not gonna go through this entire slide. It's just meant to kind of emphasize that uh, when we talk about the multidisciplinary approach or when Marco de Brommelstrad from the Urban Cycling Institute says that cycling has a lot of societal and um, constructional opportunities and constraints, even when we talk about infrastructure planning in cities, 
there are many, many different aspects that you need to take into account. And I'm underlining design guidelines because uh, I think it was Peter yesterday in his uh, presentation uh, also talked about the need for such documents here. And I'm saying, yes, you definitely need them. And with all this, you, you start get developing a process where you start getting an established funding for cycling, you start getting uh, uh, re personal resources, so you get people hired to work with just cycling, and then you start seeing city bikes come around and other important strategies that all work come together to really, really ex you know, underline the holistic approach and really promote cycling. And so far, We've seen the process on the ground. We have Dutch-style bicycle superhighways. We don't have that many yet, just roughly 10 kilometers, but we're systematically building up to 130 kilometers of them. We have Danish-Dutch-style great separated unidirectional cycle tracks already appearing in our urban core. We're seeing busy intersections with actually rush hour of cyclists. But like I said, we're not quite there yet. I mentioned that. We're a northern city, it snows sometimes, not every year, but we're used to it. But somehow when the snow appears on the ground, the uh, best practice bicycle infrastructure disappears. And it's, this is not a barrier. And I wanna emphasize this, it's not a barrier and seeing things like this in the winter hasn't stopped us from doing what we're doing. But it's just convinced us more and more that we need to do similar shifts in mindset with maintenance planning as we do with infrastructure planning and construction. You don't just buy one or two plows and hope that they will take care of it. You need to also transform the entire system. And we also have a lot of this old style infrastructure where you used to have a really wide sidewalk, but then we realized that there's too many people on bikes. We just kind of split that sidewalk in half with the white line and treat kind of treat bicycles like traffic, but then forget to pay any attention to the traffic signage. This is totally uh, contrary to our current principle, so this is disappearing infrastructure, but a lot of the current status quo is still this, because we have, we have 1,200 kilometers of bicycle infrastructure. Not all of that needs to be transformed, but so far we have, we're only in the beginning stages. And that, hence, the cycling model share for the past 10 years has remained stagnant at 10%. But as many people here realize, 10% is not bad. But if you want to make it to 20%, it means that we need to do something drastic or more substantial, maybe not drastic. It's a wrong word to put in. So how do we get there? It rains in Helsinki, it snows in Helsinki, we have hills, it's windy. It seems like a lot of those premises given to us by our geographical locations are fighting against us. We're still at, at 10%. And back in the year 2000, we were at 5%. So when you think back to this grimacing picture of how we forgot that the bicycle infrastructure exists, um, a couple of days later I took this picture. So just the same amount of snow, but the thing is that somewhere where we have, happen to have the right equipment and the right driver, they, they managed to take care of it just fine. Just the problem is that we don't have a systematic approach to maintenance yet, but we're developing it. But we can see from this that, yes, there's actually no obstacle in taking care of this Danish style infrastructure even when we get our Nordic harsh winter. And yes, Copenhagen is our main source of inspiration, but yes, we definitely also look at the Netherlands. We, we do a mix, we kind of cherry pick the best and make that into a coherent and continuous. And when we look at this picture, if I got a Euro coin for every time I hear someone in Helsinki saying, oh, look at that picture, it's sunny and warm, and Denmark and Copenhagen so far south, they have summer all the time, and it never rains and snows. Yeah, from our perspective, Copenhagen is a southern town. We, we think of them as a really, really moderate climate, so I always like to show them this picture. Same place, but in the winter. It could just as well be anywhere in Helsinki. The only difference is that for some reason, the Danes, who are not used to snow, are dealing with it just fine. And if this doesn't emphasize it enough, uh, if it doesn't even stop the Dutch when it snows, then what the hell is the excuse of Finns, who, I'm not lying, we roll in the snow naked, we drill holes in the ice to go swimming in it, but for some reason, we find it impossible to ride a bike in the winter. So it's not about really uh, the conditions, it's about how normal it is. So, we move on. We have a bicycle action plan. 
with the, with the main target of making Helsinki into a year-round cycling city fit for all people of all ages and abilities and doubling the cycling model share. Uh, we uh, listened to the people, we asked the people of Helsinki what would make you cycle more. So this is the service design perspective. We're not just planning for ourselves, not thinking about ourselves as designers, but we asked the people, realizing of course these are subjective opinions, so we need to interpret that to find the true needs of the people, but surprisingly enough, when we ask the people what would get them to cycle more, it's mainly infrastructure. Safety, safe infrastructure, safe bicycle parking, good maintenance, better construction sites. So when you have construction sites, don't just forget about cycling. And with all these in mind, we've created five sub-goals for that main goal. So one, of course, the network, the A to B, build the infrastructure, make every destination in the city reachable by bicycle, take care of that infrastructure with proper maintenance year-round, and when you have construction sites in the city, which you do have, don't just block off the cycle track. Consider the bicycle as just an important mode as the cars, as the pedestrians, so that you know cycling remains easy even when you're building. Uh, we know that every journey ends and starts in bicycle parking, so we need to have high quality and proper amount of bicycle parking. And then the fifth thing is we need to communicate this change to all the people so that's to justify what we're doing in order to create a more positive image of cycling. And uh, it all comes down to really this thing. Uh, Dan mentioned that why people in Copenhagen use the bike because it's fast. Another really important feature to underline is that it's easy. For them, it's just as easy as sitting on a chair. And everyone here sees how easy it is sitting on a chair. But uh, would sitting on a chair work if the chair was built like that? It's a, it's a really great illustration by Copenhagen as design company. And it is a, a little radical way of showing it. but. It simply is true. If you have a bicycle network built with this principle, it won't work. And you will not see the volumes show up. So you need to make cycling easier. And how you get that is realizing that wherever you have a built environment, there's a need for, to take the bicycle into consideration on every square inch of the city. On every street, every square, there's some need for consideration. You can't just neglect it. Because people, they're the same people moving on bike as they are on foot in cars or public transit. And then you need to make a case for it. So you need to justify to the politicians and uh, higher levels of administration that why we need to start investing more money. And then you need to show them that, well, it's ex that's exactly what it is. It's an investment. It's not a cost. So when we did an analysis on uh, what kind of return on investment we would get when we properly, and I emphasize this, properly build Danish Dutch style bicycle infrastructure. And if you do that properly, you get on average an eight euro return on a one euro investment. But that does not include just drawing lines to separate bikes. You need to have the integrated approach. And with this, assist, the uh, process went on to us finally getting the investment level of cycling to 20 million euros a year, which was about 9% of our entire transport budget. And actually this year, it went up to 25 and a half million euros. The politicians really understood that, okay, we need more money for this. We need to get all this done. And uh, we, have, we don't have that much time. And uh, this is what it really comes down to. This is the uh, image of the target network for inner city Helsinki. And on, in red, you see unidirectional bicycle facilities. In, in red, you see bidirectionals. And these are all, once again, Danish, Dutch, standard issue bicycle infrastructure. Currently, we're in a really fragmented situation. So you remember the picture of the chair, you remember me saying that our model share hasn't gone up. Many people are wondering the same thing in Helsinki, this is why. I always ask them, how well would a tram work in a network like that? But of course, I mentioned that we have old style infrastructure, and it's true, so if you put the old style infrastructure into that picture, you see that they are connected somehow, but it's not, continuous or coherent in terms of best practices. And even with this, we have some missing links. And we need to get all those built in order to reach our goals. And we have eight years. And um, what that looks like in practice, just giving you a few sneak peeks. This is a bicycle superhighway tunnel being constructed under the main railroad, sta railroad station in Helsinki. This is a bridge connecting the peninsula of, uh, of um, Kronovuaren Ranta to the, uh, to the uh, urban core. A distance currently is 14 kilometers to go around, 
but with the bridge, it's going to be reduced to three kilometers. And what's great about this bridge is that it's not allowed for cars. It's only for pedestrians, cyclists, and trams. And it's going to be the longest bridge in Finland. It's going to be a true landmark. And by 2031, we need to have the inner city target network mostly done. And we also need to have a good portion of our bicycle superhighways constructed. And this is the bare minimum. And now we realize that we need to get to this level five years earlier. And that's the uh, debate or conversation that's currently going on. And we're not stopping there. By 2050, the, in the entire city needs to be accessible by Danish and Dutch style standard bicycle infrastructure. And we are, we are determined to doing that. We are committed to doing that because these targets have been approved by our city board, meaning that we need to realize them. And now that more and more the environmental aspects are being taken into consideration just as well as public health, we see that we have no other option. And um, systematically, we're going to start seeing more and more unidirectional bicycle facilities in our urban streets. We're going to see more and more four meter wide Dutch style bicycle superhighways connecting the outer suburbs of Helsinki. We're going to see more and more high quality ample bicycle parking at our public transportation hubs. We're going to see functional winter maintenance on all our main routes for cycling and uh, slowly and surely make our way towards the top. You know, we here, we're not Amsterdam, we're not Copenhagen all the time and we had this marketing campaign uh, last spring where we decided, okay, well, I mean, we're humble Finns, so why not just aim for third best? So, I mean, we can, we can share the podium with Amsterdam and Copenhagen. So we'll be like Amsterhagen or Copendam instead of it's Copenhagenized version of Helsinki. It, it got a really good reception from the people in Helsinki. Unfortunately, many people now think that the, the strategic goal of Helsinki is to become the third best cycling city. Well, that's not what it is. We kind of played around. Remember, it's the humble goal. We just want to be the most functional city in the world. Yeah. Uh, before before I, uh, I end my presentation, I just want to do a little promotion. We have an up and coming Finnish cycling embassy and we are not competing with the Dutch cycling embassy. No, we just want to kind of uh, add to the mix and uh, work as a catalyst. And we are actually now planning a first international study tour event in Finland in August. And so if anyone here is interested in coming to Helsinki and seeing what I'm talking about here in real life, you'll get your first chance in August. So I have some actual brochures with me with the same information as you see here. So if you're interested, just, you know, tap me on the shoulder and I'll tell you more. But now, on behalf of myself and our entire bicycle planning team, I by no means do this alone in Helsinki. I thank you for your attention. Actually, you are the first bicycle coordinator which I, whom I heard rapping about bicycle infrastructure. Very motivating way <laughs> of presenting things. Uh, zase je tu príležitosť uh, spýtať sa nejaké dve, tri otázky. Sme celkom dobre na tom s časom, čo je až pozoruhodné. Takže prosím, zvihnutá ruka a, a váš príspevok, ak sa chcete spýtať, komentovať, čokoľvek. A keďže nevidím dobre potentín, tak poprosím pán Martina, že či tam ty vidíš niekoho, kto sa hlási. Ak nie, tak ja dám otázku. So I will ask you like a couple question. So, so you are in a position for how long, sorry, that's the first uh, process questions, how, how long you serve or work as a bicycle coordinator, please? I've been the bicycle coordinator for a little over two years now, and I've been working for the city of Helsinki for a little over three. Okay, so, so and that was the first question. The second is that what was the biggest challenge for you in this position? Well, a lot of the biggest challenges, like uh, making the new design guidelines and drawing out the network and getting it ac accepted, was already done before me. So now I'm just, just like sort of surfing the wave. But there have been uh, challenges, of course, just getting this new bicycle action plan approved in the city board was a challenge. Mm -hmm. Because there are people in high level administration in Helsinki who uh, noticed that there were measures such as traffic calming. Mm -hmm. And we don't have political will yet to reduce car traffic. We only have political will to make sure it doesn't rise, which is not enough, by the way. You need to make it reduce, but we haven't gotten that far yet. So there was quite a bit of a struggle 
to get that accepted. I mean, it, we needed to make some compromises, but they were well thought out compromises. So now that we're working in close collaboration with our carbon neutrality team, we know that we're gonna get there, but we just can't talk about traffic common. We need to be more engineering about it to kind of sell it. That's probably been, been the biggest, biggest so far. Okay, you mentioned uh, team. So, so probably you are not working alone, but you can rely on somebody on a team or a group of people or a special position of somebody that's climate ambassadors or something like that. How many people can you rely on in your work? Uh, well, my team. Uh, so there's, biggest team? There, yeah. there's seven of us in our team. Then I can rely on the head of our, uh, of our environment unit. Mm -hmm. I can rely on a really close colleague who's not in our team, but was one of the original ambassadors of cycling for Helsinki, who was the, uh, working on the uh, design standards. So about 10 people in total are someone I can 100% rely on. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Oskari, thank, thank you very much.